Okay. We are live. The participants are coming in. I'm going to get started in just a moment. Welcome to the webinar. Hey, everyone. Here they come. All right. We're live. All right, great. I am going to kick us off while we're waiting for a couple more people to come on. I see our participant list growing. We're live on Facebook, but I'm going to get us started because we've got so much to cover today. So hi, everyone, and welcome to our final big event of the week. We are celebrating the introduction of the Farm System Reform Act this month. And we brought a number of events to you this week, including reports from our organizers in the field, a live streamed event about consolidation and the food system with our executive director, Winona Howder. This webinar is entitled, How We Organize and Win a Just Food System. And we're gonna try something a little different with you this evening. We wanna share a conversation with you between all of us here at Food and Water Watch. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about grand sweeping legislation like the Farm System Reform Act, but also talk about how we approach organizing and power building. Today, I'm joined with a group of seasoned experts in the field of food policy, research, legal expertise, and organizing to talk about why the Farm System Reform Act is so crucial. It's a piece of federal legislation that was reintroduced by Senator Cory Booker and Representative Ro Khanna that would ban factory farms, transition farmers to a sustainable farm model, and enforce important antitrust provisions. I'm the senior organizer on our factory farm team, and my job is really exciting because I get to work with our state-based organizers across the country who are working to stop factory farms. I get to build support for the Farm System Reform Act and other federal policies, but I also get to work with all of my guests joined here today. So Michelle Merkel is the Managing Director of Advocacy Programs at Food and Water Watch, and she helps shape and steer our organization's work to mobilize regular people to build political power, to move bold and uncompromised solutions to the most pressing food, water, and climate problems of our time. Amanda Starbuck is Food and Water Watch's senior food researcher and policy analyst, and she has led the development of a lot of the really comprehensive research that we use that helps inform the policy that we fight for. And Tara Heinzen is Food and Water Watch's legal director, and she leads a team of attorneys working to hold our government and factory farms accountable through both impact litigation and legal support of our organizing campaigns. So uh, Amanda, Michelle, and Tara, thank you for joining us today. You've got a, a fabulous lineup of folks here to speak with you. I'm really excited to get started on a conversation about our food system, organizing to build power, and also just a positive vision for our future. I think we all need that. So. Uh, to all of you joining, thank you, and we're going to dive right in. And actually, I'm going to get us started with um, a personal story question. So first question for everyone is just what are your personal stories? What brings you to this fight? I think it helps really paint a picture for people of where you're coming from. So why do you do this work? And maybe let's get started with Amanda. Sure. Yes. And thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, yeah. So for me, farming has always been, you know, a part of my part of my life. I Grew up in North Dakota. My grandparents were farmers. My mom actually was not a big fan of farming and it was her goal in life not to marry a farmer and she succeeded twice in that. So I did not get to grow up on a farm, unfortunately. Um, but my grandfather was growing um, hard red spring wheat and just watching, you know, them struggle just to make ends meet as farmers, especially, you know, in the early 90s following the 1980s farm crisis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they always had it pretty tough, but, you know, even in the 1970s when prices are really good for farmers, they managed to put all five of their kids through college, which is pretty amazing. College obviously costs less <laughs> than it does today. Um, but the community that they grew up, that they lived in, just I saw start to fall apart, you know, as time went on. You know, the only grocery store that actually my great-grandparents used to own eventually closed down because of Walmart opened 
up um, about 20 miles away, became another bar. Pretty soon bars just took over the town. That was the only thing that was really open anymore. Um, and so just, I really kind of carry those, not only just an appreciation for, for farming and farming communities, but also just examples of what happens when we you know disinvest in our real communities. And so came out here to um, Washington DC for grad school, ended up staying um, and just really wanted to, to be able to continue to advocate and fight for the people that I that I care about back home. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think I think that really paints a picture of kind of where you came from and now the work that you're doing. So thank you. Um, who wants to go next? Tara, do you want to follow? Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. So I also grew up in the Midwest, but also not on a farm. But when you grow up in Wisconsin with family from Iowa and Minnesota, farming is still a part of your life and it impacts your life. And just over the course of my childhood, I really saw the rural landscapes in Wisconsin and Iowa in particular change as factory farming took hold. And it was impossible not to notice the impacts on the environment. One summer, the local lake where I learned to swim was closed because an Oscar Mayer plant discharged into this lake and it had a huge pollution upset, closed the lake all summer. Another summer I was camping and Lake Michigan was just filled with dead fish, no one could swim. I've been a lifelong nature lover and also an animal lover. And I was studying environmental science and policy in undergrad. And it all just came together and became really inescapable to me that the way we raise animals is just at the intersection of so many issues that I care about. The environment, climate change, animal welfare, worker rights, public health, and ultimately democracy. So I got into this work because the factory farm system is just one of the worst ways that corporate power has manifested in society and that we have to deal with it today. Yeah, yeah. Michelle, I know your story is a little bit different. Do you wanna share how it's a little bit different? Sure, thanks Rebecca. Um, I did not grow up in the Midwest. I grew up in, playing in the woods in Pennsylvania, but the farms in my area were really small family farms. So I really had no idea that there was a movement afoot um, to sort of push farmers to get big or get out. Um, so, as a young attorney EPA in 1999, however, I started to learn about the shift that all over the country, these really small farms were disappearing and being replaced by these large industrial complexes. And people knew at EPA at the time that these factory farms were polluting waterways. But in my first case, we heard from people that they were already, that were also being poisoned by toxic gases from the decomposing manure. And so when I flew out, to Missouri to see like what I was facing, what I was litigating over. I was confronted with 21 large scale complexes. These were spread across four pretty small counties. They had a thousand buildings that warehoused 2.5 million hogs. And these hogs produce as much waste as a city of 10 million people. And the waste was stored in these massive sewage pits that were several football fields big. So there were 163 of these massive pits. It was shocking. Um, and not only was I introduced to factory farming through the case, but I also got a lesson in politics and, you know, corporate power, because in the middle of the litigation, this is right after the Bush administration came into office, I walked into work one morning was told, listen, you need to settle this case really quickly, or you're going to lose it all together. And you need to stop all of the other investigations that you helped to initiate against other big mega factory farms. Um, and so I learned at that moment that justice and fairness, you know, I can't take it for granted that we have to build people power to hold elected officials accountable so that government agencies, um, including EPA, whose mandate's really clear, right? Everyone knows they're supposed to protect the environment and public health, but we need to constantly press them to do their jobs. And so the people who were fighting factory farms in their communities at that time, and the people who I've met over the years, have really inspired me to stay connected to this work. And, and as well as many of my wonderful colleagues at Food and Water Watch, including you know, the folks on the call tonight, I think, do think we have the best warriors for food system reform in the country. So I'm really proud to do this work alongside everyone at Food and Water Watch. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I think your story is a really good segue um, into Food and Water Watch and our ethos and what's so wonderful about our team here and working together, but also kind of what makes our viewpoint unique. And some of some of the personal stories I think that you share today show all that that we bring to this work that helps make the perspective unique as well. It's in part the people. So, so I think the net for net the next part. Let's talk a little bit about what makes Food and Water Watch unique and kick us off with how we work on our issues and how we approach our work. Uh, Michelle, do you wanna start there? 
Yeah, I mean, I can kick us off with uh, Food and Water Food and Water Watch's origin story. Yeah. So Winona, our executive director, she left an organization called Public Citizen about 16 years ago to start Food and Water Watch as an organization that really isn't afraid to call for public policies that humanity needs to survive and thrive, rather than what's, you know, focusing on what's politically possible in the moment. And she was super fed up with the whole DC strategy of lobbying and inside politics without connection to a grassroots base. There was so little critique among DC environmental groups about capitalism and the invisible hand of the magic market, green groups. We're generally talking about using the market to protect the environment rather than regulation. And there just really wasn't a lot of appetite for speaking out against policies that were destroying what was left of our social safety nets and the environment. And so she was really outraged um, also about the inequities and disparities that were being created and the role that um, mainstream Democrats were playing and threatening our food and water resources. So our core values from the beginning were about justice and fairness and equity and a clean and safe environment for everyone. And so what became increasingly clear through, who li through her lifetime of activism, which really started in the early 70s, was that the only way forward was to create a, you know, a strong countervailing grassroots movement that combines social justice values with the fight for a clean environment. And that's why she founded Food and Water Watch. She believes we all believe at Food and Water Watch that another world is possible. And, and so over time, banning factory farms to create a more just and equitable food system that protects the environment, workers, animals, the climate, um, became one of our three signature campaigns in our strategic plan. We also work on water issues and climate change issues. And these are issues that really connect all of us. And there's a lot of intersection, which I think you know, we'll definitely touch upon tonight. Definitely. Yeah. So, so how do we approach that work, Tara? How do we think about building power? Sure. So I'm not on the organizing team, but even our legal team has really embraced our theory of change. So hopefully I can speak to it a bit. But if you're here, you probably know that Food and Water Watch works towards really bold solutions to some of the most challenging and tractable problems of our time. And we don't get scared off by the challenges that face us. We know, though, that winning will require us to build the power to hold elected officials at every level of government accountable to the people, not their corporate donors. And we do that by building grassroots power. We have strategic on the ground organizing campaigns across the country that engage everyday people in demanding the policy change that we need. This is really hard long-term work, but as Michelle said, this is necessary. We can't afford to settle for what's politically possible right now. Our job is to change what's politically possible. So even though we won't pass the Farm System Reform Act and the other legislation you'll hear about tonight overnight, We've had a lot of successes over the years, and those show that we can win this fight if we work from the local level up to build a bigger and bigger movement of people mobilized to win the just and sustainable food system that we all need and deserve. Yeah. Yeah. And just to say and build off of that, you know, we we really focus on on planning our planning our strategy that way. But we also have organizers on the ground in a lot of places. So we've got Iowa, Oregon, New Mexico, Maryland, Delaware, and they're all they're all taking on the taking up the work to stop factory farms or the factory farm system. So you you bringing that all up just reminds me of also maybe why folks are here is they work with an organizer uh, in their home state. So um, so thank you all for joining us also. But Amanda, you work more on the research side and the policy side, and can you kind of share Food and Water Watch's view on how we incorporate that in our campaigns? Yeah, yeah, it's really central to, to all the work that we do. I think one, th one of our strengths is that everything that we do is grounded in facts, grounded in research, and grounded in science. Um, and so, and the, and the research that we do isn't just, you know, sitting in an ivory tower and talking to other academics. I mean, we're putting together fact sheets and issue briefs to help our organizers on the ground doing that work that you just mentioned. Um, for instance, for example, when we decided to really, you know, ramp up our our call for banning new factory farms. We did a national report that outlined all of the injustices and exploitation from this system, everything from you know, impacts to real communities to impacts to workers and everything. Um, and then from that, we branched off and did a few fact sheets for different states that are also mobilizing their own campaign so that our organizers have data and research that they can point to to really help move these issues. And we also, you know, we'll, we'll take the same data and make it into policy, policy briefs and things that we can share with um, 
folks who are talking to the representatives and just have really informed, you know, kind of niche policy in there as well. Um, and we work very in close, you know, coordination with our organizing team, with our litigation team. And there's really a lot of cross, um, cross silo within Food and Water Watch, which is really, I think, one of our powers. Yeah, definitely. I know I use a lot of that in my work and, and it's actually kind of funny. I um, I can't tell you the number of times that I've actually found one of our fact sheets from another organization using it or across someone else's desk. So I know it's really uh, pivotal and, and really useful for the work that we do on the ground. So I think um, it's, it's a testament to how it's embedded in our campaigns to build power, definitely, um, especially with our food work. And I know you work very closely with us on that. Yeah, so, yeah, and from the policy side too, it you know informs my ability to speak to these policy issues when I'm really you know working yeah, <laughs> like some part of the research out of it too. So yeah, yeah, in meetings with on on the hill on mm -hmm. Capitol Hill with staff, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I know we're here also just to talk about broadly the food system. I wanted to ground people in a little bit of why we come to this work and a little bit of Food and Water Watch and how we approach this work also, but. Um, I want to take us back and really kind of get into some specifics about the food system. So we, um, over the years, traditionally small farms, we know this, have been replaced by factory farms. And right now, today in the United States, and increasingly food systems around the world through our export of them, are being dominated by factory farms that can find tens of thousands of animals into cramped spaces, unsanitary conditions. And we say this all the time, but I wanted to emphasize it before we get into talking about the problems that none of this is an accident. It's really an intentional decision that we're now faced organizing against. So everyone on this call knows we need to ban factory farms and fundamentally change the food system and improving practices on factory farms isn't gonna take on entrenched political power of the meat industry or, or how it's made our way into policies in the government. So uh, we're gonna start talking about some of those efforts and get into it, but I just wanted to set, set the stage there. And I really laid out some of the overall problems with the system, but can each of you in your own words, share some of the biggest problems with our current food system? Sure, no, I started. Um, yeah, I think if, if you take away anything from this conversation, it's that our, our food system is within the, you know, with the hands of a few powerful corporations, right? The corporate takeover of our food system. You know, farmers didn't just decide on their own that they wanted to, you know, get huge and raise animals in these really terrible conditions. It's really they were pushed oh, into this by, you know, corporate powers who really dictate in the way that we raise our food in this country. Um, and this is on every single step in the food system. So everything from the seeds um, that farmers buy, you know, the, so I think the top four companies control like 85, 90% of the seed market to the genetics that go into the cattle that are raised, um, to the feed, um, everything down to the grocery stores. I mean, today, Walmart takes in about one in every three or four four dollars that we spend on food in this country and um and you know we're at the same time we're, we're given this false sense of abundance and choice you know you walk into a supermarket and you you know just go down the cereal aisle like I don't even dare take my two-year-old down the cereal we'll never leave because there's just so many options and choices and colors but we just did this analysis um with the guardian um and just to show that there's so much consolidation even within um the supermarket aisles so for instance even if you want to try to buy, for instance, alternative proteins, you know, some of the biggest companies out there, Boca Burger, Morningstar, are owned by these large corporations as well. You can't escape it. And so, yeah, I mean, just to kind of really hone in what you said, like, this is not an accident. This system is built, built to entrench power and wealth within the hands of a few. Yeah. And I think that your example of, of growing up really highlights the funneling out of wealth also, which is so deeply felt in places across the country, especially now with so many rising inequities. So I think that that really um, speaks to some of the, the biggest pieces of the problem. Yeah. Amanda or um, Michelle, I know you were thinking about environmental and public health problems. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, we, they are certainly environmental and public health abuses are definitely some of our biggest problems in our food system. Um, people are often surprised to hear that agriculture is the number one source of water pollution in the United States compared to every other industry. Yeah. So we now have over 13,000 miles of rivers and streams and 60,000 acres of lakes um, that aren't safe for things like swimming or fishing or for providing drinking water. Um, 
ag runoff is responsible for 80% of excessive nutrients. And, you know, nutrients sound benign. It sounds like a good thing. Nutrients, though, like uh, phosphorus and nitrogen in our in our freshwater can cause the growth of algae. And that algae will choke out aquatic life by consuming oxygen and, and blocking sunlight. And nitrate contamination of drinking water can also cause very serious health impacts, which we've seen in our members, blue baby syndrome in infants, birth defects, it can increase certain types of cancers. Um, and there are you know, a multitude of other factory farm or pollutants in factory farm waste that post or pose health risks like um, Pathogens, I think there are 150 pathogens in factory farm waste, heavy metals, antibiotics, pesticides, hormones. Uh, and in addition to all of these pollutants that are um, poisoning our waterways, factory farms are also significant sources of air pollution. So there was just a recent study published this year that found that deaths caused by agricultural air pollution are greater than those caused by coal-fired power, pro coal -fired power plants. So agriculture causes over 17,000 premature deaths a year and 12,700 of them are specifically from factory farm air emissions. And the primary source for this air pollution is ammonia. It's a toxic chemical in and of itself that comes from decomposing manure, but it's also a precursor for what's called fine particulate matter, which can cause asthma and other respiratory problems. And over the long term, increases the risk of dying of things like heart disease and cancer and strokes. And so all of these numerous public health risks from factory farm pollution has led the American Public Health Association to call for a moratorium on new and expanding capos. We're so excited to have them as a partner in this movement. Um, in addition to all these toxic chemicals they admit and, and push into our waterways, factory farms drive climate change, they threaten biodiversity, I could go on and on. Um, the list is and, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the, a long list. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I, and you know, I always think of this, um, if anyone on the call li lives near chicken factory farms or been near chicken factory farms, whenever I see that stat or the, the when we talk about particulate matter, it's something that you can, if you've ever been near them, actually feel like right away in your lungs if you're not used to being near them. So it's That's something cool. that is is so incredibly impactful that people are forced to live near every day. Um, and kind of speaking of community or impacts on community members or people, uh, we deal with that all the time with our legal work. And Tara, I think you were going to speak to to some of the community impacts. Yeah, thanks. So. You know, Michelle talked a lot about the environmental and public health impacts. They are deeply interconnected with the everyday quality of life impacts that these facilities have on people living in and exposed to these pollutants. You know, we work with community members who can't keep their windows open in summer when manure is being spread. They're sickened by the pollution when they're trying to work on their own farms. People who can't have their grandchildren over to their homes because they're worried about their granddaughter's asthma or just embarrassed to have people come over when their house is unlivably impacted by the smell of this industrial waste. As Michelle said, a lot of people can't drink their water safely. Groundwater contamination from overapplication of waste and leaching from waste impoundments into groundwater impacts people's health. I've talked with people who are scared to get their wells tested because they don't want to know if their water is unsafe because they can't afford to dig a deeper well. And of course, no one should have to leave their home because they're affected by these impacts from factory farms. But many people who would choose to leave simply can't because living in a community with factory farms means that your property value is probably going to plummet. And that traps people in these situations across rural America. And we also know that these impacts are not felt equally. Factory farm industry, like other corporate polluters, is extractive and targets low income and environmental justice communities that lack the political power to keep them out. We also see that meat companies cite their slaughterhouses and their processing plants in certain communities, and that has the effect of inducing the growth of dozens or hundreds of factory farms that are built up to supply those plants. And as we've seen these industries continue to consolidate more and more in the last couple decades, that means that facilities are getting larger and they're increasingly concentrated geographically in certain environmental justice communities who bear the brunt of this. These impacts also divide communities because often the industry brings the promise of jobs into communities that no longer have a, strongly, a strong family farm-based 
rural economy. And so factory farms can divide neighbors against each other with the promise of jobs, but also the threat of environmental and health and quality of life impacts. And I'll just last say that, you know, often residents that we work with or hope to work with are unwilling or unable to speak out for fear of threats or retaliation from the industry or folks who work in the industry, or because they have family and friends who work in the industry because there just aren't any other options. So it can really have a chilling effect on advocacy as well as dividing rural communities against each other. Yeah, I mean, all of those things that, that you just said in my work as an organizer, I can I can think of a person popped into my head that I work with or try to work with or a story that we've come across. So it's it's truly really happening. There, there are people, there are names behind all of the examples that you just gave that actively pop into my head. So, um, but, but there are, you know, those are two really big pieces, I think, that we really actively work on on a daily basis, but there are other impacts too that sometimes I don't think about as much, but um, are there anything that Michelle or Amanda you wanna add on just the big, big problems? Yeah, I think bringing back to, you know, the decline of, of rural America and, you know, like I, I appreciate you mentioning my story again, that that is not a unique story. It's, I think it's echoed across so many small towns and rural communities across America. and you know, being against factory farms is not being anti-farmer, it's actually being pro-farmer because with, you know, the growth of factory farms, we have seen a significant loss in just the number of farms and the viability of farms. And so, and that goes hand in hand with the health of our, our rural communities as well. Yeah, and, and to say that a lot of, so in a lot of these places, factory farms actually re replaced a really diverse agricultural economy. And so part of the, us talking about a positive vision for the future, which we'll get to a little bit in our conversation is, is looking to some of those roots, but just planning for a bigger and brighter future um, from that, because people still remember that as well. Um, you know, the whole factory farms aren't inevitable piece. Yeah. I'm always reminded of too, when you bring that up. So um, great. Yeah, I mean, this isn't gonna be a surprise to anyone, but money and politics, right? <laughs> We're up against that all the time. We've got corporate money being thrown at our elected officials in both parties by big agribusinesses. And during the 2020 election cycle alone, I think the food industry spent $175 million on political contributions. About two thirds of that went to Republicans. So, you know, it's tough organizing in rural America. The democratic bench is not deep. Communities also feel rightfully abandoned by the democratic party, including by current leadership in the executive branch. Um, you might remember, I mean, in 2008, Barack Obama won 43% of the vote in rural America, three points higher than the share of votes that John Kerry had in 2004. And support for Democratic House candidates was higher in 2008 than in 2006. But right. all that changed in later elections because after significant rural gains in 2008, President Obama largely avoided rural communities. You might remember that critique of Hillary Clinton when she was running for president. And the Obama Biden administration discarded promises that they made to farmers. So during the 2008 election, the Obama campaign said it would confront the growing monopolies that control every aspect of our food system that Amanda talked about. And this messaging really resonates across both parties. Um, and they did in early 2010, the Attorney General, USDA Secretary Vilsack held a bunch of hearings around the country, about five. Food and Water Watch helped to organize those those, those hearings, thousands of farmers and food workers showed up to testify and then virtually nothing. The administration took almost no action to do anything about consolidation and antitrust violations. They continued to approve mega mergers throughout their administration, despite all of the promises that they made during the campaign and the hearings. Um, the one thing they did do is to embark on a, a rulemaking to try and address some predatory practices and competition but they didn't finalize it until the end of their eight years. It was never implemented. It was undone quickly by the Trump administration. So, you know, recently the Biden administration issued an executive order, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, to commit to greater antitrust enforcement, to address some competition issues and predatory practices. But we've been down this road before. Secretary Vilsack was USDA secretary for the entirety of the Obama Biden administration, was most yep. recently worked for the industry as president and CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. So they do have an opportunity to absolve themselves, but nothing is gonna happen good if we are complacent. 
and assume that something's going to change if past behavior is an indicator of future behavior. And then quickly, I'll mention Congress because we need comprehensive legislation. But we have a 50-50 split in the Senate. It does not leave us any real margins. We don't really have that much of a margin in the House. So we need to build a movement to work with our Capitol Hill allies to push our elected officials and both parties, including corporate Democrats, to have a vision for a better food system. And not only a vision and a big vision, but make that vision a reality by passing legislation like the Farm System Reform Act. Yeah. Definitely. I think you you bring up a lot of like when we approach our work, these are really big challenges. And um, just thinking about some of our staff calls, it, it's so much of the strategy is pushing the corporate Dems that say they believe in this thing when they get elected. It's, it's across the country. It's not just our food work. Right. It's Absolutely. always pushing to hold those that accountable that say a certain thing. Um, and, and usually one of the, one of the really strong strategies when we teach kind of work with organizers and volunteers, when we teach strategy, one of the really key strategies to pushing specifically those Dems in office is building a broad-based coalition. So that's really essential for the food work that we do for passing farm system reform act and all of these, uh, people that are kind of the revolving door that we have to hold accountable specifically with the food and farm system. So, so any other challenges, um, Tara, Tara, Amanda, there are a lot of challenges in our work. Can Tara, you speak to some of the urgency? Yeah, so we're building power to push our agenda. Industry is doing the same thing. And we are up against a well-financed, as Michelle explained, a well-organized, extremely politically powerful industry. And industry is not on the defense because of our current administration. It is on the offense with legislation and greenwashing tactics that are meant to undermine our movement and further entrench factory farms. So we need to respond with urgency. Um, first, industry is attacking our movement with a whole range of legislation. Things like ag gag laws, which are laws that criminalize the undercover investigations that expose the factory farm industry and its disgusting practices. Also passing increasingly oppressive so-called right to farm laws. These are laws at the state level that limit citizens' rights to hold factory farms accountable for the pollution and the impacts on people's quality of life. They really put the polluters' rights ahead of citizens. And also state laws that limit local government's authority to regulate things like the siting and the operation of factory farms. So eliminating any local control that could put in safeguards and effectively rolling out the red carpet for new and expanding operations, which I saw play out in Wisconsin, where I'm from. The state passed what they called a livestock siting law, and it eliminated local control and a state that had been dominated by small and mid-sized dairies for generations has rapidly become dominated by mega dairies. At the same time, industry is pitching a host of false climate change solutions, and they are gaining traction really quickly. So first, Factory farms, as Michelle explained, they store waste in these huge manure pits. And these are sources of the extremely powerful greenhouse gas methane. But instead of changing practices to prevent these emissions in the first place, meat companies are actually teaming up with fracking companies <laughs> to produce what they're calling renewable natural gas. This is factory farm biogas that's used to generate energy from capturing that methane coming off manure pits and injecting it into fossil gas pipelines. This not only greenwashes factory farm gas as clean or renewable energy, but it's heavily subsidized and it's effectively producing another revenue stream to make factory farming more profitable and incentivize more and larger facilities. It's also important to note that this could extend our reliance on fracked gas infrastructure and slow our transitions not only away from factory farming, but also fossil fuels. And also on the false solutions front, we're seeing a big push to create carbon markets. And these would allow polluting industries to purchase credits generated by agricultural practices rather than reducing their own carbon emissions. We know this will harm environmental justice communities because it lets industrial polluters off the hook. And there's also no reason to believe that these carbon banks are actually gonna reduce our climate emissions. We should be investing in regenerative practices for a lot of reasons. Um, and many of these practices might sequester some carbon, but agricultural carbon reductions are hard to verify, they're really variable, and they're also temporary. So they can't substitute for the reductions in emissions that we get from keeping fossil fuels in the ground permanently. So there are a lot of big challenges, um, but I think industry wouldn't, wouldn't be working so hard to undermine community power 
and greenwash its image if we weren't having an impact. Definitely. And your your team specifically has been really vigilant on, you know, the 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 happy marriage between fracking industries and factory farm industry is has been happening in the past couple of years. And so we're really vigilant on how they're trying to permit. And, you know, we have a really big fight in Delaware right now where we're trying to stop this one project that would have impacts across the region, bring bring an incentivized factory farm waste across the region. They're already talking about trying to get more um, more of the big integrators to, to buy contracts with them basically. So I know your team has really been looking at some of those nuances and it's part of building the work to organize against things like this. So um, just reminded me of that story. Yeah. Um, Amanda, I know you, you, and we talk about this all the time and then, and I know you have a good, a good thought and takeaway on, um, I think one of the challenges that we face specifically on our organizing and kind of in the, in the policy space as well, because there's all this individualism is the vote with your wallet kind of idea. And that's, more of a cultural challenge that we have. There are these, uh, um, Michelle and Tara talked about these, these integrated or integrated challenges, really structural challenges, but this is a little bit more of a cultural challenge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're told to, you know, vote with our wallets. And I think there definitely is value to be, you know, set in supporting your local farmer if you can, um, if you choose to eat animal products, you know, purchasing from a farmer that you can meet and talk to and stuff. But at the end of the day, like, that is not going to fix our system, unfortunately. And I think a lot of us maybe come into that. I'm one who came into this trying to fix the system with my dollar, you know, trying to shop more locally and support the farmers markets. But you know, came the realization that that's not going to shift, you know, the needle far enough and where we need it to go. Um, you know, case in point. So I think right now about a quarter of all of the pork that we produce in this country gets exported abroad. So even if all of us decided tomorrow to stop eating pork, we're still going to be producing pork on factory farms and shipping it to other countries that are growing and eating more meat. It's just the way it is. Um, and so, um, yeah, and along that same line too, you know, I mentioned, you know, alternative proteins, which some, some people, you know, use because they don't choose not to eat meat, which is totally fine. But that also is not going to <laughs> break down the factory farm system. There's a lot of buzz and a lot of um, excitement around, you know, lab grown meat, which I'm a little skeptical of for the safety reasons to begin with. But even beyond that, you know, if we had that scaled up on a way that was actually affordable and people could buy, you know, all these meat alternatives that were not grown on farms, that's not going to challenge the power that these big companies have. That's not going to change the systems that we have. Um, and so it, it's really important to, you know, not, you know, to eat in a way that, you know, reflects your values, but to realize that we really need to get together. And as individuals, we can't fix the system, but we are stronger together. Um, and, and I think along that same line too, we need to recognize, you know, so one thing that really kind of broke my heart when I moved up to, to DC for, for grad school is a lot of my classmates in my environmental policy classes were very like hard on Midwestern farmers, you know, like, oh, they grow too much corn, oh, they take in too many subsidies, oh, they use too much nitrogen fertilizer, all this stuff. And it's like, you don't realize that a lot of these farmers have no other system available to them. If you yeah. have been told to get bigger get out by the USDA and you have, you know, invested in hundreds of thousands of dollars of tractors and combines, and you're part of a system that incentivizes you to grow as much corn and soy as you possibly can. And you decide tomorrow, oh, I want to grow tomatoes instead or something. Where are you going to sell that? Is your local elevator going to store tomatoes for you? Do you have a market for that? So like, it's not how things work. And so, you know, you need to recognize that even on a farmer scale individually, one farmer is not going to move the needle. We need people to get together and demand change at the policy level if we are going to try, you know, truly transform the system. Yeah. Definitely, and that this is just reminding me. So yesterday we had a conversation, um, Amanda, Winona, our executive director, and myself to talk a little bit more about really getting into the nitty gritty of consolidation. And I can't recommend Foodopoly enough for those of you who haven't read it yet or heard about it. It's Winona's book that she published in 2012 that really, if you're interested in, in how we got to where we are and, and why the big players are so powerful, you can take a look at the kind of back and forth between government and industry there. And it's, 
It, uh, I know anyone who I talk to about it who th works in food system or thinks about the food system uh, cites it as one of the most foundational texts that they've read. And I can't have a better recommendation than that, really. But um, so if you're interested in more of that, definitely check that out. And I will just kind of transition out of our challenges by saying, I think you all answered those big questions in different ways, which is part of the puzzle that we're building here. And it's really clear that we're up against a lot. You know, corporations have endless resources to lobby elected officials and influence our public policy. One of the reasons that I really love working at Food and Water Watch and with this team is that we're really poised to take on those big issues like the current food system by working to build people power and remaining an independent organization that does not take any money from corporations. So to do this, we actually have thousands of people for our members who contribute and become our members. Our average monthly donation is actually just $15 a month and they say many hands make light work. So many people chipping in really does and do build the resources that we need to carry out a lot of our strategies to win. So if you wanna support our campaigns financially, a monthly donation to Food and Water Watch is really one of the best ways because it helps us plan and build to build long-term to really build enough pressure that we need to organize and pass legislation like the Farm System Reform Act. So if you are able to, we're gonna drop a link in the chat if you wanna become a monthly partner with Food and Water Watch, or you can also increase your monthly gift. Obviously a one-time contribution is always appreciated as well. So any of that we really appreciate and um, yeah, thank you. So with that, I wanted to get a little bit more into how we approach our work. I mentioned just now that, you know, in order to carry out our strategy, we need long-term planning. So these are really big forces that we're up against to reform the food system. So what's the strategy? What, what, are, what do we do to take on the forces that are against us? Um, Michelle, do you wanna start? Yeah, let's talk about the Farm System Reform Act, <laughs> which we've mentioned multiple times. So organize, 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 right? For ultimately um, comprehensive federal legislation that's gonna transform us out of our factory farm system. So we mentioned, Rebecca mentioned, you know, Farm System Reform Act was first introduced in 2019 mm -hmm. by Senator Cory Booker and Representative Co uh, Ro Khanna. We are super grateful for their leadership and they just reintroduced, reintroduced it a couple of weeks ago with um, greater numbers of original co-sponsors. And this ground groundbreaking bill has um, really become the North Star of a national movement to ban factory farms. It's also a key pillar of national efforts to address climate change. And so what does it do? We mentioned that the bill upon passage would require an immediate ban on new and expanding factory farms, large factory farms specifically, and a phase out of existing facilities by 2040. So in order to facilitate the phase out of all existing large factory farms, the bill provides $10 billion for voluntary debt forgiveness and transition assistance to allow farmers who wanna transition out of factory farming to do something more regenerative in nature and sustainable. Um, we talked a little bit about all of the environmental impacts from pollution. Um, gosh, there's so much to get into that we haven't talked about, but in certain sectors like hogs and chickens, um, contract growers grow the animals for the big companies like Purdue, like Smithfield. And under these contracts, the companies own the genetics, the patents, the animals, the profits, and the contract growers get responsibility for the environmental pollution and for the dead animals. And in the Farm System Reform Act, we uh, it would hold corporations responsible and liable for their pollution and dead animals. It also would put liability on the big companies for adverse health effects that, you know, as Tara talked about, neighbors of these factory farms experience, or if they, uh, for a loss of enjoyment of property from odors, from flies, from all the stuff that people have to put up with. And it also has what, what we call citizen suit provisions. So citizens can sue um, these big companies directly to enforce these aspects of the Farm System Reform Act. And then also um, the bill enacts a series of market reforms that make it possible for small farmers to compete. Uh, I think someone mentioned the Packard and Stockyards Act um, earlier, this would, uh, the bill would strengthen that law to protect family farmers and ranchers to ensure fair competitions, um, protect farmers from predatory practices. And finally, the bill would restore um, mandatory country, country of origin labeling requirements for beef and pork and extend that to dairy products and prohibit 
USDA from labeling foreign imported meat products as products of the USA. Right now, a lot of our meat is grown overseas, then it's packaged here and it's stamped product of USA, making it really difficult for our farmers um, raising livestock, especially the right way in the United States, it makes it difficult for them to compete. And so to build public demand for this bill, we also have a number of state-based moratorium campaigns in Iowa and Oregon. We have factory farm campaigns in Maryland and New Mexico. And it's really no mistake that the three Senate leads on the bill, Senator Booker, Senator Warren, Senator um, Bernie Sanders, visited Iowa and other states during their bid for the presidency and saw how factory farms were destroying rural communities. They talked to impacted people. Without a doubt, the organizing work that Food and Water Watch and our allies are doing in Iowa absolutely, absolutely cemented a bigger vision for this food system and inspired the Farm System Reform Act. So as we said already, anything is politically possible with enough people power, including banning factory farms. Um, we're excited about this bill and we, but you know, at the end of the day, we know it isn't gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take time. As Tara said, this work is long-term. So while we're building political power for what we want, for legislation like the Farm System Reform Act, we have a lot of facilities, existing facilities that need to be held accountable. We have 1.6 billion animals raised on 25,000 factory farms producing 885 million pounds of waste. So what are we gonna do with these facilities while we're working towards our comprehensive federal legislation? And, and I think Tara as our legal director does a lot of this work. So Tara, do you mind talking a little bit about that? Sure. I'm very impatient for that Farm System Reform Act citizen <laughs> lawsuit provision, but while we wait to pass that bill, there are some other tools in our toolbox. Um, so yeah, we try to use strategic litigation at Food and Water Watch that's really aimed at undermining some of the systemic policy drivers that Rebecca was talking about that have enabled this food and farm system to exist in the first place. Because as we know, it's not the product of efficiency. It certainly didn't result from consumer choices, and it absolutely was not an accident. Um, so we aim to use the law to advance transparency in the food system, to hold polluters accountable, and also to stop industry expansion. All of these are critical to making factory farms begin to internalize all of their social and environmental costs and start leveling the playing field. So to advance transparency, I'd already mentioned ag gag laws. We're challenging multiple ag gag laws. And we're also working in court to expose the federal government's active role in financing factory farms. The Farm Service Agency, which is part of the USDA, has put its thumb on the scale by financing factory farms to the tune of billions of dollars a year, and with very little regard for the environmental impacts of that financing. So we're challenging that now. Accountability is also really key to our impact litigation work. As Rebecca said earlier, a failure to regulate factory farms impacts, including their pollution, is one of the main reasons that this model of livestock production has been able to take hold. So we're working to change that. We have quite a few lawsuits underway right now against the Environmental Protection Agency, against the USDA, and against other federal and state agencies for rolling back environmental protections, <clears throat> excuse me, or failing to properly implement our environmental laws, excuse me. We also take advantage of opportunities to sue major polluters like slaughterhouses when they violate the law in ways that have catastrophic environmental impacts. Um, and of course, we also have to try to stop factory farms as Michelle was talking about from gaining an even greater strangle, stranglehold over the food system. So this really ties back, I think, to the biogas work and the Delaware example in particular that Rebecca discussed. We work really closely on the ground there with community partners trying to identify legal strategies and hooks that we can use to oppose this biogas facility that's gonna really draw more factory farms into this community. And we're also looking for other strategic opportunities to do the same thing. We can't stop every factory farm. It's a whack-a-mole game because this is such a systemic problem, but we can look for those really high impact situations where we can stop a major project that will have broad ramifications. And in addition to this kind of impact litigation to change the system, we support, as in Delaware, our organizing campaigns with legal strategies and tactics that can help slow down a project and build time for organizing and that can help advance our narrative in the public and in the media. And also can help directly build our base of support and win short-term victories that get us closer to our long-term goals. So we've got a lot of legal work going on on a lot of fronts. 
Yeah, and a lot of all of that is, so we've got the, the big policy strategy, we've got the state-based strategy, we've got the legal work that's mirroring that across the country. But as you kind of mentioned with biogas, we have a ton of these false solutions or, or solutions to the problem that are actually just solidifying the problem. So Amanda, we do some of that work as well, right? For our strategy. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm, I miss false solution lady tonight, but yes, um, happy to talk a little bit more about that. I think we just need to be really cautious about any sort of quote unquote solution that has the backing of the big companies that are um, currently behind, um, you're currently backing up these solutions. And so I think that's part of what we're doing here at Food and Water Watch too, is kind of you know, pulling back the curtain, you know, um, helping people realize the greenwashing that is happening. And, you know, I think factor farm gas, biogas is one of those, those perfect examples about greenwashing. They call it biogas. It sounds nice and clean and happy, but we call it factory farm gas. And that's exactly what it is. Um, you know, and we need to be skeptical when companies like Smithfield, for instance, are really investing in, you know, bail out of this because they know that this is just going to cement their future in factory farms. Um, and another one, too, that I think, you know, is also bears mentioning again are the idea of the carbon offsets that, uh, that Tara mentioned. So we're fighting um, a really bad bill right now called the Growing Climate Solutions Act. Again, really happy fancy name and it's got bipartisan support and everybody wants bipartisan legislation to pass in this Congress, right? Um, but again, you know, you need to take a step back and say who is behind this bill and who is supporting it? Well, Microsoft and Bayer Monsanto um, and Syngenta and all the companies that are controlling um, our food system already because they know this is not going to challenge their status quo. I mean, just for example, um, Bayer Monsanto, the makers of Roundup, which is this cancer-causing um, herbicide, are saying that using the herbicide in a no-till system is regenerative. <laughs> and that would actually possibly qualify as a practice that would be an offset. So they know that, you know, pushing this and making it seem like they are behind solutions, that they are behind, you know, regenerative farming is just a way to cement their power. And, you know, one more thing on there as well that I think really bears mentioning is, you know, where are the, where are the farmers in this situation? You know, why is Microsoft really interested in carbon offsets, you know? And I think it's not just a greenwashing tactic for them, but, you know, there's a lot of tech that goes into, you know, even just quantifying, um, you know, the amount of carbon that is taken up by the soil. And that requires data on the farm, collecting data that belongs to farmers. But, you know, there's there's a lot of fear of what could that be used, you know, against them because actually this data becomes proprietary for the companies. Farmers have to purchase it back in the form of analytics to even get the data on what they need to plant. And it's going to end up driving recommendations for the very chemical inputs that these companies sell in the first place. So, yeah, all that to say that, you know, part of our work is not just, you know, fighting for the good policies like Farm System Reform Act, but really being vigilant about the, the false solutions that we see out there. Yeah, and so we've got, all right, so we've got big policy, we've got our legal work, we've got the state-based work, we're opposing some of these solutions. People sometimes ask, and I know we're a little short on time, so we might want to um, put, put some of our, our thoughts together here at the end, but I know people ask also, are there any other big policies, you know, Farm System Reform Act isn't everything, so I know we have a couple of those, they're really hopeful if you want to, if you want to share um, other, some other bills that we're working on. Amanda. I can start with one. Yeah. Um, so there's another bill that we, we helped um, support and introduce a couple of years ago called the, it's a big, long, wonky name, Agribusiness Merger Moratorium and Antitrust Review Act. Basically, it is the ban and the moratorium on mega mergers, right? So there has just been, I mean, we've talked about corporate consolidation, you know, since the beginning of this, but this is something that has really ramped up um, in the last few decades. Um, we used to, we have antitrust laws that date back a hundred years, you know, laws that were passed during the trust busting era that really helped to level the playing field for farmers. Um, you know, so back, back in like 1917, I think it is the top four meat beef packers controlled like 75% of the market or something. Oh. Um, and so the government came in and said, no, this isn't going to happen. Here are some laws to help have some safeguards to prevent that from happening. It also broke them apart. Um, and then in the 1940s and 50s, they even you know, went after the supermarket conglomerates. There was a supermarket called A&P that I think at its height controlled maybe like 
30, no, 15% of the market or something like that. But then, you know, a lot of our vigilance fell and there was a bipartisan, you know, understanding that, oh, well, maybe market efficiencies, maybe consolidation is actually good for consumers because maybe it lowers prices, which actually is not necessarily the case. The FTC themselves have come out and said that it does not lower food prices, but be that as it may, what started in like the 80s really got carried on by Democratic and Republican administrations alike of just really falling asleep at the wheel, not enforcing our existing antitrust laws and really weakening them and weakening them in the courts as well in the way that they were interpreted. Yeah. So all that to say is what this bill would do is put an immediate stop on mergers between agribusinesses above a certain size. And it would also um, look at past mergers and see if there are you know, ways that we can have better safeguards. You know, are there even possibilities of breaking up these big companies that have done so much damage and destruction? Today, the top four meat packers control about 80% of the market, 85%, so more than they did 100 years ago when we set this legislation. Walmart controls what 33% of the grocery market. So more than twice a and did in the 1950s when we broke them apart. We can do this. We just need our elected officials to stand up to these powerful corporations. But we know we have done it before and we can do it again. Yeah, I think I think this is just reminding me that people absolutely need to look at that consolidation live stream, absolutely need to read your reports that you've worked on, and absolutely need to read Foodopoly. Um, there are a couple other policies in there, but I know we're running short on time, and I, and I wanted to do one more just, you know, this is part of a movement, Michelle, I know we've talked a little bit about Farm System Reform Act and where we've come from, so, you know, how do we actually pass policies like Farm System, Merger Moratorium, a few of the other ones, you know, um, how do we hope for the movement? Yes, and thank you for mentioning there's a supply management bill. I'm just mentioning his names because you can look at Amanda's research. We support so the not. Black Farmers Act that's, you know, seeks to end some of the historic discrimination against Black farmers. But these, we think, are a package of bills that will help us to make the full transition to a, a more sustainable food system. And just to, I mean, I sound like a broken record, but it's really about organizing, right? Starting at the local level, building support at the state level and building then ultimate demand for the federal fix. We know we can do it. When we, since we were the first national organization to call for a ban in 2018, in less than two years, since we called for a ban on factory farms, we had active factory farm moratorium campaigns in multiple states that we mentioned, you know, we then had the Farm System Reform Act, originally supported by 17 national and grassroots organizations, now supported by over 300, including you know, animal welfare groups, um, public health organization, farmers. You know, we have increases both in our state campaigns and our federal campaign for our legislation, an increase in the number of co-sponsors, right? And we have this amazing polling from last year that shows that 89% of Americans are concerned about industrial animal agriculture. 85% of farmers and their families support a ban on new industrial animal agricultural facilities. So there is a movement. We have shown in other fights that when we come together, we can achieve audacious goals. We have a template for success. Um, I'll quickly mention since we were the first national organization to call for a ban on fracking, we've collectively banned fracking in four states. Um, it was a big topic of conversation in the last election. Everyone had to have a position on it. I mean, we have the winning formula to win rooted in building political power like it has been necessary for every other social justice movement. So we're forever looking to bring in stubborn people into the movement who can't stand injustice, who don't like half measures, who like to win because having a world where all of our basic you know, human needs clean and safe and affordable food and water, a livable planet, um, a world where all those needs are met is worth the fight. So that's what we're here tonight to ask you to join us if you haven't joined us already. And we so appreciate, I appreciate a lot. I know we all do. Um, I, I don't think you could have teed up, um, Amanda, I know we had talked about some other ideas there, but I don't think you could have teed up my last and favorite question any better than that. Um, you know, we're here celebrating the Farm System Reform Act, but I love to ask the closing thought of we've won, we've banned factory farms, we've passed the, passed the Farm System Reform Act. Tara, you've done all your impact lit, uh, litigation. You know, the world is, is sunny and beautiful. Like, what are you looking forward to most personally and what does that look like for you personally? So whoever wants to start that closing thought. 
I can start. Um, I just want to see more farmers back on the land. I want to see young people staying in rural communities or moving to rural communities. Um, I want to see main streets <laughs> robust again and small grocery stores to come back. And I want to see diversity of who's farming, you know. I want to see more farmers of color and people from all backgrounds who are able to make um, and own and work on the land. I second all of that. Um, growing up, my hometown did not smell like mega dairy waste. Now it does. I would like it not to anymore. No one should have to be afraid for their health to swim in a river or stream. I never don't think about what's upstream anymore now that I know about this industry's impacts. You know, personally, I'd love to be able to buy, buy a veggie burger without worrying that I'm lining Tyson's pockets or even better. Everyone should have access to good products from local farmers that they can support instead. And I think ultimately, you know, we need to completely redesign the human relationship with nature, with agriculture, with animals, and view all workers as deserving of dignity. And so we need some really transformational changes, um, and hopefully everything will look very different um, when we win. I second and third all of that. <laughs> and I, I just add, you know, I have a, a young daughter and my family plays a lot in rural places and my extended family lives in rural places. And I would love a world where my daughter and really all future generations can drink safely from a tap without a filter, which I can't do in my own house. I would love my kid to be able to drink from a stream like I used to do as a kid without thinking about whether it's safe. I want her to be able to swim in a water body without thinking about whether it's safe. And I you know, want her to be able to enjoy wild places or live in a rural community someday without worrying about it being destroyed by factory farming or other polluting industries. So. This is what we're all fighting for, right? A world for everyone where everyone's basic needs are met, including access to safe, accessible, affordable, clean water and food and a livable climate. I want it all. <laughs> no compromise, I love it. And I'm certainly, you know, I'm looking forward to all of those as well. I think, thank you for bringing and grounding your, your personal stories from the beginning to end of why we're here, why we do this and what we're fighting for. Um, I wanna take a moment just to thank everyone for joining us and kind of some of the stuff can be complicated with food and farm policy. We have so many resources. Um, if you're interested in deep dives on it, we also have so many resources if you're interested in getting involved and I'll just kind of quickly go through this myself, but if you're interested in getting involved, you know, we have a new website. Amanda has a bunch of research that was recently released that can really help orient you to the part of the fight that you want to be in. We have a new research library that's up on our website. So definitely check that out. I will be putting it in the email that you get after this as well. You know, we have state-based campaigns and volunteer networks in the places that you live. I know there are folks on this call that are involved in those and we, you know, we spend a lot of time with each other. So I think that's wonderful too. We built really wonderful networks of, of you know, you get involved in the campaign, you make friends too. So um, I know we all have our friends and allies in the movement. So you can definitely join state-based campaign. We're also going to have a volunteer event for specifically the Farm System Reform Act on August 5th. And so we're gonna put information in the chat for that as well. We're gonna go a little bit more into Farm System Reform Act and kind of how you can volunteer um, and get involved a little bit more at that level. But before we leave you tonight, I know we're like two minutes over, I'm really fired up and hopeful, you know, about what we've talked about today. And after this conversation, um, I love spending time with my wonderful colleagues and, and friends in the fight and with a shared vision. So before we leave each other, I did mention this before, it really does take resources to plan for this work. And I know sometimes we can be really busy, so it's hard to get involved, especially if you're short on time and have the means. Monthly donations really, really, really do help us plan long-term to be able to hire more organizers, people like me, to support our volunteer leaders. So as little as $5 a month, you can join our monthly giving partners program, which is really cool because as an appreciation for your dedication to the work, we actually offer special events to those partners. So the link again is in the chat. Um, I'm gonna send around those resources and more information on that if you're interested. Um, and on all of the events this week, you're going to get those in your emails. So thank you, Amanda, Michelle, and Tara for joining us and all of you tonight. We can't wait to hear from you and to organize with you. We'll see you soon and good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.